All right, everybody, here we are for episode 45 of Now Showing with Mike and Wayne. Wayne joins me once again here in the garage. Episode 45 is going to be one of my favorites, unlike the 45th president, who we will not discuss. Yes, I'm taking political already. <laughs> Boom! Happy to be here. All right, yes, we always like to go towards the politics when possible. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're going to bring in a guest this week to help us talk about our topic. Our good friend Andy Rohr is on the line. Andy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. My friends call me Andy. My enemies call me Hackstone. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for bringing me into the show, you guys. That is a teaser, everybody, for, for later in the show. That's what you call a teaser in the biz, yeah. Yes, teaser. Hackstone. One of the greatest names put to film. Uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, May the 4th be with you. Coming up in two days, uh, it'll be May the 4th. That's when we're recording this podcast on May 2nd. But it's going to be all about Star Wars today. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 we'll be stopping you. We might have to pay a royalty fee. Don't go any further. It, was only, it wasn't five <laughs> seconds. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so we are going to talk all things Star Wars. Uh, Wayne is a huge Star Wars fan. I think people that know him know that. Um, I am a casual Star Wars fan. I watch all the content, but I usually watch it, you know, once or twice. I'm not uh, obsessed. But as I am obsessed with other things, Wayne, Star Wars is his thing. And Andy as well. Andy is a big Star Wars fan. That's why we brought him on the show today. Most so, Wayne, I'm yeah. going to let you get started on what you want to talk about with Star Wars. All right. When we talk about one of the most iconic space franchises, or just franchises in general, in American cinema... I mean, Star Wars is going to be at the top of the list, and I can literally go for hours, days, weeks, months, years discussing and arguing and sharing. That's not what this is right now. We are planning a big Star Wars review type thing for later months, so stay tuned for that. We're just going to talk in general and just about the franchise, what impact it had on us, our experiences with it. You're keeping it very general. We're not going to talk about the sequels were terrible. <laughs> well, the prequels were garbage or anything like that. We might touch on it, but we're not going to go into extreme detail. Uh, I'm just going to start off a little bit with, you know, George Lucas, where he came from, his background real quick here. Growing up in Modesto, California, he attended UFC, USC Film School, uh, 1963. And after graduating, he formed a film company with Francis Ford Coppola called The American Zeotrope which quickly failed, and they had to go their separate ways. <laughs> Luke, this led George Lucas to uh, the creation of uh, Lucasfilm Limited. <sighs> um, the Star Wars films, he said, are loosely based off of the 1930s Flash Gordon Buck Rogers space operas and uh, influenced heavily by uh, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Mm -hmm. Uh, he wanted to make these uh, space sci-fi pictures to compete with the likes of Planet of the Apes and 2001 Space Odyssey. So Andy and Michael, um, what was your first experience with Star Wars? Do you remember how old you were? Or Andy, I'll let you go first. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and I love the topic, Wayne. Uh, may the fourth be with you. Um, it's one of those things, and so I'm I'm 39, so I, I was born in uh, five years after the series started, but I cannot remember a period so that I don't have didn't have Star Wars in my life. So I'm probably going to say like my what are my earliest memories? So three or four. So by that point, you know, it was just ingrained, and I had an older brother who was into it as well, and you know, I had mountains of the toys, the, the VHS copies, albeit ones that my dad, you know, synced up with, you know. The, 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 the dual VCRs, I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about here. Yep. What was great is I was actually missing a part of Return of the Jedi where Vader throws his lightsaber and it, like, where it Luke's on that bridge above him on the, on the, the, uh, the Death Star mm -hmm. and it breaks the bridge, you know. I, did, I, did, I didn't see that scene until the 90s, probably re-release. So I, I initially thought that was like an added scene. So <laughs> just kind of a funny, funny, little, funny little note there, but... You know, you, Wayne, you spoke to your fandom, and, and and I would say two words for my fandom: Porg socks. So I'm an owner of Porg socks. Porg socks. <laughs> wow. Porg socks. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I figured that was worth a while. Um, <laughs> I don't read any of the don't read any of the books though, um, and I'm kind of not too familiar with the with the Clone Wars series, okay. the anime series. 
Um, but other than that, I kind of like, you know, soak it all in. And like Wayne said, I could talk about this stuff, you know, endlessly. Well, you know, when they created the porns, they wanted people to buy the merchandise. So I think you helped them out there. With oh, that. porn. I thought you said Hook, porn. And I'm like, why does that fit? Porn. <laughs> you got a Princess Leia outfit as well there? Porn. The porn. Oh, okay. The porn. Yeah, you were looking at me. Like, you said porn, Wayne. Seriously? Yeah. Where, where, did, where did my mind go? <laughs> yeah. Who, Wayne was like, geez, we let this guy on the show? <laughs> <laughs> Derailed already. Jeez. I mean, I've got a couple of parodies we could talk about, but geez. Yeah. We're not going to go into those on this episode. That's has been a special episode. That's, that's at Wayne, Wayne and Mike after dark. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> we made a hard right into Zach and Mary there for a second. My apologies. Um, yes. So, yeah, so for me, um, I would honestly say you talked about the re-releases in theaters in the late 90s. That was probably my like i'd already probably watched them but that was probably when i first started to kind of respect them more yeah um i got to see the originals in theaters um which you know again you guys are a year older than me so they came out six years after i was or before i was born uh so i definitely didn't get a chance to see or at least the first one did um i didn't get a chance to see that one in theaters and the other two i was pretty young Mm -hmm. uh so i don't remember if i did or not um but yeah, having being able to see those versions, I know they're not the original versions, but those versions mm-hmm. in the theater uh, was pretty cool, especially at like 15, 16 years old. I can't remember Absolutely. how old I was when they came out. Uh, so that was when I kind of started to pay more attention. Um, and I know we're not going to talk about how good or bad, some, but you know, that was kind of like the unfortunate part of like watching those to then lead up to Phantom Menace because mm-hmm. we already knew it was coming out. And then, obviously, we all know the, the majority of the disappointment that was Phantom Menace. Um, so that was maybe kind of stunted it a little bit for yeah. me until uh, Revenge of the Sith, which, you know, then, obviously, uh, that one uh, I really enjoyed, too. Uh, so being able to kind of see the old ones, but then also being one of those people that got to see all three of the new ones in theaters, even though they are the prequels. You know what I mean? Like, it was still, like, this is ours as opposed to, like, our parents had Star Wars, we had this one, even though it wasn't great. It was still something that, for our generation. So I thought that part was kind of cool. And to kind of be a part of that uh, was pretty sweet, I think. For me, or for me, <laughs> um, my dad was a big Star Wars fan. He was a teenager in the se- in 77. I think he was 17. You guys were born in 1960, so simple math. Look at me, I can do it. So, yeah, he was real ingrained as a teenager, and uh, uh, I was born in 82, uh, between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So, I was about three going on four when my dad had or procured or stole, somehow got a VHS copy of Return of the Jedi, and I watched it, and, you know, as a three going on four-year-old child, I loved the Ewoks, how misguided I was. And I remember distinctly being sad when, uh, spoiler, uh, Yoda became one with the Force. I was just ingrained, and just, it was amazing for me, the whole lightsaber fight at the end. And I, this is legitimately my first memories that I can recall is sitting there watching Star Wars, getting excited. And, you know, I, my dad then had to get uh, copies for The Empire Strikes Back and the original Star Wars, which... You know, it happened. It probably took about a year before I saw the other ones, or maybe even a couple years, because like I didn't know there was more than one. Like, <laughs> there's three of these. Awesome. And That's, from there, yeah. it just went on, and you know, watching and wearing out the VHS tapes. Um, you know, just being completely ingrained in that nerddom, if you will, because you know, <laughs> you talk about Star Wars too much in elementary school. Everybody's gonna look at you kind of weird, and not talk to you. Yeah, I think I, I would say the same on that last note, Wayne. I, I think once the '90s hit, it was pretty out of out of style. If people mm-hmm. younger listeners can believe that, mm-hmm. there was a period where Star Wars was really not in vogue at all, and, that, and it wasn't it wasn't until the build up for the re releases that it started to get cool again. I guess you could say. And that, and like I said, that's kind of where I was with them, like it, and. You know, in the 80s and stuff, like, I grew up, you know, watching Ghostbusters and Gremlins and stuff and Goonies. Those were my movies that I remember more fondly. Um, so that, the the re-releases, I think, did help kind of a generation enjoy those movies as their own almost, really, too. Um, and kind of got to experience it as a once-in-a-lifetime generation thing, even though it, it now, yeah. because it's so massive, it keeps happening. 
Yeah. <laughs> Fourth and fifth generations now. Yeah, honestly. Exactly. Yeah. With, uh... I want to. I want to note too, because uh, Wayne, you and I shared a similar story with like our dads having to make these copies. I just want to make sure for anybody listening who are wondering, like, wh- why was it so hard to get VHS copies of this? Because at the time, those they were just one hard to find, and they also cost upwards of eighty dollars. Yes. You know, to get copies yep. of these in in the mid eighties or so. So yeah, it was, it was just uh, it's hard to hard to imagine, but. Well, it wasn't even until the mid to late 90s that VHS tapes were uh, re- available to purchase sooner. Yeah. Like, you yeah, still right. had to wait, like, six months. I remember, uh, this is just me going through my own history, I remember uh, Jerry Maguire, like, 96. That was, like, one of the first movies that was a- you were able to purchase immediately as it hit mm-hmm. home video. And so that yeah. was, like, 96, 97. So, just people that don't know even what VHS is, <laughs> imagine not being able to get your digital copy or your Blu-ray immediately. You yeah. had to wait a long time. You could rent it from the store if you were lucky enough <clears throat> to catch it in stock, uh, but they were, like, really hard to find. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just one of those things that nowadays everything's at our fingertips. So, you, you yeah. can find, you can I, find I, almost I, anything. <laughs> I don't mean to mention that in a, you know, a back in my day, we had, oh, no, you know, of course, I don't, but it's, I don't, no, it's, I, it's more of like that. I, I, I say that also because I think it added to the mystique around True. the movies themselves, that it was, a, it was just not as readily available. Yes. If you went into a store, mm-hmm. there were toys and, you know, tons of merchandise and, and Star Wars kind of started that trend, yeah, yeah, but it was just sure. a lot harder to like, it was rare as Wayne said, well, to like have those copies. You, you might not have known t- these other movies okay. existed. Sorry, I stepped on you there for a minute, Andy. My bad. We do that frequently on the show. Uh, (laughs) You had to tape them off your TV sets, though, too. Like, that was the one way. That's how you, I'm sure, had them on VHS. That's how I had a lot of movies on VHS. Like, getting ready, like, oh, it's uh, Ghostbusters going to be on HBO. i got to hit the record button. Mm -hmm. No one touched the TV for two hours. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's just the crazy thing that used to to be And then you had to make sure you were on the channel before it started, because if you miss anything... Yep. My copy of Empire Strikes Back, I was missing like the first five to seven minutes of it, so. <laughs> no good. But yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up brought all that up, though, with uh, the toys and whatnot, because um, the licensing for toys and t-shirts and everything, uh, 20th Century Fox, I don't think, was interested in retaining that because they didn't believe in the film, so they actually just signed all of the rights to that, all of that to stuff him, over right? to George Lucas. Yep. And... Merchandising and toys have far, 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 far out exceeded what the films have made because the films have made billions of dollars. Toys and video games and T-shirts, hundreds of billions theme of dollars. Theme parks. I mean, it's it's re- when Disney purchased them, they knew what they were doing. They weren't purchasing the movie franchise. Nope. They were purchasing the name Star Wars so they could slap it on every single thing that they have. And, you know, that's just one of the ways that George Lucas changed things. Yeah. Um, obviously, he, he uh, founded uh, Industrial Light and Magic, the Which special is effects. huge, yep. Huge for the film industry. We talked... There's about... a great... Uh, I'm sorry, Wayne. No, go, go ahead, ahead, man. I was just going to say there's a great series on Netflix that you guys might have discussed previously called The Toys That Made Us. Yes. Yep. And there's a Star Wars episode in particular that talks about the licensing and, like, how Kenner came to be. But they covered Star Wars amongst, you know, Transformers, Legos, yeah, My cool. Little Pony, etc. And how uh, it took so long to get this deal in place with Kenner that it, the toys weren't going to be available at Christmas time. So they, they did right. the empty box and certificate set. There's a really <laughs> awesome uh, documentary called Empire of Dreams on Disney+. Plus. Mm-hmm. It came out in 2003 that just goes through everything that went into creating these. Uh, it's a two-and-a-half-hour documentary. Jeez. And they're not even through <laughs> the Zach first Snyder movie. was behind it. And uh, within, like, the first, like, two hours, like, hour and a half of it. It's crazy yeah. how detailed about it. Uh, also, uh, we talked a little while ago, uh, probably a couple, maybe a couple months ago, that uh, Pixar was actually once part of Lucasfilm yeah. Limited. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's just... The amount of things and the, the next, amount of stuff that we yeah. have because of Star Wars and George Lucas. That has spawned from that. And how much of a train wreck making the first movie. Well, was, and, uh, and, don't, call, and I'll say this too. Don't think that like the, the success of Star Wars led to the success of Indiana Jones. Yeah. Like being him and Spielberg being able to make those movies. Right. 
If he was, if Star Wars was a dud mm-hmm. and didn't have the fan base it did, I don't know that he would have gotten those movies off the ground. His career probably would have been dead in the water had Star Wars failed. And one of the only reasons Star Wars was possible because of the success of American Graffiti. Yes, Luke's exactly. His first feature release. I mean, we did also get Howard the Duck out of it, but you know, take what you can. <laughs> one of Marvel's rare misses. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Marvel. it was Marvel. Yep, okay. it was Marvel. I was like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> that was, you know, George Lucas wanting to make a Marvel film. It's like, do you want to, oh, you want to do Captain America or, or the X-Men or Iron Man? He's like, no, Howard the Duck. They're like, give me the duck. Yeah, give, give me, me the, the duck. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> but obviously, we talk about this. When we, if, let's get into the story a little bit here, the crux of what makes Star Wars, Star Wars. And I want to just basically talk about... I'm it's the incest, the f- right? The incest makes it stir. No. That was ah. a, a <laughs> confusing <laughs> time for us all. <laughs> and that was kind of one of those things like, I would love for he, to hear George really discuss why that happened and what's going it on. It had to have been, didn't Script plan, changes. well, just didn't plan on making it, uh, didn't know yeah. that he was going to get his trilogy made, so he kind of went with what he thought would work. Right. And then when he got, it became so big and they wanted to make Empire... You had to be like, oh, but they're brother and sister. And then you know there was that guy in the back that was like, uh, sir, sir, uh, they made out in the first movie. So we're just not going to talk about that. Or, yeah. You know, Have you, you seen really the poster for your... the first movie, too? She's, like, caressing his leg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that one. Yeah. Aren't you a little short to be a stormtrooper? <laughs> <laughs> the best family guy uh, reference yeah, in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, you stuck up. <laughs> but... The story in of itself, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not something that we haven't seen before. You know, Hero's Journey, you know, we can talk about. Like you said, he took it from, you know, uh, Flash Gordon and stuff like that, so. What makes Star Wars Star Wars is the special effects. Never before was seen, like, Mm Lucas had to come up with a way to, I'm sorry, Industrial Light and Magic with Lucas's guidance had to come up with a way to make this stuff look real because we can't just blow up planets because... There's no real way to do that. And then, yeah. obviously, the brilliance of John Williams' musical scores. Oh, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, without either one of those, I do think that Sith Wars just is a dud. Or is yeah, not something no, that I is mean, remembered. Yeah. It, there, there was so much needed to make this, this franchise successful. You had to have... Um, you kind of had to have unknown actors to start, right? Yeah. Because 77... When they made that movie, like you said, 20th Century Fox had no faith in it. So the budget wasn't great. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't cast actors that were well-known, really. Um, probably um, Carrie Fisher was probably mostly known as Debbie Reynolds' daughter at that point, not really as a, yeah. as a main actress. And Harrison Ford, I know, he was in American Graffiti, I believe, yes. for like a, a hot minute. Um, so there was that connection. But it, you kind of just... It, it was uh, serendipitous. Like, it just all had to work. Mm-hmm. At that time, with those actors, with that crew, for it to just kind of come together and be what it was, and that's kind of what I—that's what I love about filmmaking—is that like it's that magic that you know, call it magic or whatever, but just the resilience from everybody working on it together to make it what it was, and then the fans embracing what they what they had made, and you know, you yeah. saw you saw it with uh, before Star Wars, you saw it with something like Jaws. Jaws became the first big blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Well, Star Wars was following in that footstep and following that model uh, with his friend Steven, you know, Steven Spielberg set up. And you kind of have, honestly, even though they couldn't be more different, a very kind of similar setup mm-hmm. in what happens in both those movies. Um, and he just followed in the, what you could call now the blockbuster formula, yep. uh, which is where Spielberg coined that term. Uh, so it was one of those things that it's just amazing to see something like that. You call it a little movie, if you will, but like a, a movie that was just inside Lucas's head all this time, yeah. and then to see what it looked like when it came out and just how huge it's become over the 40-plus years that it's been available. Well, they were concerned yeah. about it competing with the likes of Smokey and the Bandit and other stuff that was coming out that year. So in, on May 25th, 1977... It debuted in 37 theaters across the country. 37, jeez. And of those 37, they broke box off broke the they broke the box office record in 33 of those. Jeez. Like you could not get a ticket for this thing for weeks or months, and that's why it stayed in theaters for literally years. Like people would yeah. go and see this 
dozens of times. Yep. It's like yeah. Probably in 379, I think it was still in theaters. Right. Yeah, well, before they had a home video. I mean, you know, they. Right. It, the next step, again, for you young people out there, the next step from theatrical back in the day was TV. There was no home video market until the 80s, uh, and VHS was the winner over beta. And it was, and the, even when it was decided that was what they were going, it still took them time to get everything out and how they wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. Um and as we all know, we lost the aspect ratio with VHS and right. four by well, three. That's why I said. That's why you always got that disclaimer. This this video has been modified from its original format. Yep. Yeah, just a crazy times, but uh, just amazing what they've been able to do with this franchise. Um, and it it's just been something that has stuck with people mm-hmm. for years. And like you know, like you said, like you guys both said, your dad showing you those movies. I mean, has been you guys showing them to your kids and. Yep. Kind of led this. It started, this yeah. Cycle. <laughs> I want to. I want to hit on something that that Kirky you mentioned about uh, kind of the team element, you know, of the, of the movie and why you know all these things coming together, um, you know. And Wayne, you mentioned the special effects and how like, extraordinary, particularly for that time. But you also think about the production design. You know, think about in that just in that first movie going to Tatooine and going into the cantina, like what that feels like and what that. You know the what the bar looks like. Think about some of the alien characters that are in that. I mean that it's unrivaled, and in East you still people. I mean the fact that the sequel trilogy is still trying to, you know, capture that magic. So here we are, over forty years later, and that's still like, you know, one of the most memorable scenes in modern cinema. You know, mm-hmm. just looking at that cantina scene, um, it, it's uh, it's, you know, and and I, I also wanted to hit on the uh, the editing. You know, the editing yeah. of the film, like particularly when you compare it to other late 70s movies or sci-fi movies, action movies, the editing of Star Wars, A New Hope, is is, is just has a very modern feel. If you watch other 70s action films from that time, the pacing is just so much slower. Um, and it's, 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 that's, I think that's one of the other legacies of the series. Glad you brought that up because it, Star Wars, you know, later dubbed A New Hope, won seven Academy Awards. For production design, for editing, sound design, and best visual effects. I forget what the other three are, but um, yeah, just the, you're talking about what this, this movie did, and it was recognized by the Academy for incredible achievements. It was up for best picture and best director, I believe, and obviously it didn't win, so. But still, to come away with seven Academy Awards on something that nobody had any faith in is incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was definitely, one, it had to have been one of the surprises of that year. Obviously, we weren't alive yet. But yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm assuming that everyone was probably just as surprised. Yeah. So, let's, uh, you know, we got the original three. Obviously, Return of the Jedi came out in 1983. We did not get anything Star Wars related other than a... The Christmas special? The Christmas special, which uh, I've actually never seen because we, I've been told to just oh not. We, so. Okay, so it's, I just decided right now, it'll be part of our special before Mando Season 3 in uh, whenever the end of the year. Yep. We'll both watch it because I've never seen it either. It's on Disney+. Plus. Nice. So we have we have to watch the holiday special. Uh, have Andy, either of you seen the Ewoks Ewok movies, the TV movies? You know, because those are up there now too. I I feel like I did when I was a kid. I don't remember them at all though. I don't remember them yeah. either. I definitely went through a phase where I was just there, the, you mentioned like the lack of content, mm-hmm. and I was just like scratching at everything. So I, I have <laughs> I have seen both of those. I mean, they're not good, you know, but. I've watched them, you know. There's there's Ewoks in them. We'll have to watch those too, then. <laughs> when uh, I think it was, gosh, it had to be what '96 when they announced that they were going to make new Star Wars movies. Yes, but '96. Uh, that sounds about right because I think '97 was when they started re-releasing the originals yes. in theaters. And, uh, yep. In preparation Through for '97 the, to '98, the, yeah, the '99 release yes. of the Phantom Menace. Yes, exactly. Uh, Andy, I want you to just uh, touch a little bit on what your excitement level was and what your feelings were when you heard that this was actually happening. Oh. Well, the most memorable... I mean, I remember watching the trailer for the very first time for Phantom Menace, and that, and that along with the first image of Darth Maul, I mean, that's like that takes the excitement level to yeah. 11, you know. Now, we, 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 we don't. I know we don't want to hit on, like, maybe some of the disappointment that was that, that first prequel movie, but the lead-up to that... Yep. Especially following the re-releases, there was just such a such an incredible excitement 
um, and I was, I was probably like, you know, a, I was getting to the point where movies maybe didn't, you know, as you get older, you're not, you kind of lose that, that kid's sense of excitement, but that was maybe one of the last times I felt that, mm -hmm. like looking forward to it for months, yeah. you know, when am I going to see it? What, you know, um, so yeah, the Phantom, <laughs> Phantom Menace, it carried with it, you know, I mean, like I said, the trailer and then just that image of Darth Maul, like that, that, that feeling is something I won't forget. Right. Now, I mean, I understand that, you know, and obviously some of the disappointment has subsided in recent years because of the purist fan base, if you will. Some would call them toxic, just completely destroying the la the latest three movies and whatnot, and even encompassing that into Solo and whatnot. Um, I did not ever really have a problem with Phantom Menace. I mean, there was enough cool stuff in there that mm -hmm. I could look past the long, drawn-out stuff. To me, it was like, just boring. I mean, that was, yeah. that was to me, that was the... The last, you know... You don't like movies about movie. trade policy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you can, you can lump Attack of the Clones, this, uh, episode two in there as well, where the last 20 minutes of the movie... Mm -hmm. Uh, really tries to make up and save for the other more bo boring or mm -hmm. romantic aspects of it because that lightsaber duel between Qui-Gon Jinn, Darth Maul, and Obi-Wan Kenobi was fantastic with the mm -hmm. Duel of Fates yeah. song that, you know, rivals anything else in Star Wars. You know, in the second one, we finally get to see Yoda fight with a freaking lightsaber, yeah. which, what's going on? Oh, my God. <laughs> ah, <laughs> <yes. I'm> <laughs> All right, well, let's not get too much into them. Well, yeah, don't I'm just saying, you know, yeah. not, not going in. Well, and you, yeah, you had a more positive experience yeah. with them. And again, I, I, I've gone on record saying I'm not the biggest fan of the episodes 7, 8, and 9. But to say that they ruined my experience no. as a child or they ruined my child, yeah, come on now. <laughs> and I, I try to see it from these people's fan base, you know, this, their, their, their point of view. Like, they ruined Star Wars, like... You know, I understand it was such an important part of your life, mm -hmm. and you know, it's not ruining. It, they're not taking away anything from yes. the original trilogy or anything. You know, they may not have done what you wanted with the original cast, mm -hmm. and you know, that's part of my gripe. But I'm not going into that. But still, for what it is, you know, it didn't. And then to go on and attack the actors and yeah. people who made this movie—that's movie, that's like, stupid. That's dumb. Anyway. Stop this. Um, I do want to go back here, though, for a little bit, if I can. Yeah. Um, so I do want to point out, this is another old people thing. Uh, Andy talked about watching the trailer for this movie and being pumped for it. I want people to know, younger audiences, if you're listening, in order to see trailers back in the 90s, most of the time you couldn't get them anywhere else other than the actual movie theaters. So whatever the movies were, you had to go see them in the movie theaters to see the trailers. Because... You would maybe catch one on TV, but it was like a 30-second snippet. Yep. Where, like, the full minute-and-a-half, two-minute trailer, two-and-a-half-minute trailer would only be in movie theaters. So, sometimes you would just buy a ticket to a movie. You're like, oh, I heard the release in the X-Men trailer. I'm going to go watch this mm -hmm. crap movie just so I can see the trailer. Um, so, that's just something I wanted to point out, too. The other thing I wanted to touch on real quick um, is we, you know... People our age, our generation, or older crap on the prequels and the new sequels all the time. But what I want people to remember is there's, there's a generation of kids who grew up on 1, 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. Phantom Menace, right. Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith. Who look out upon those movies as we look upon the original trilogy. Yeah. Now, in our eyes, they may, it may not be how we see it, but they grew up on it. And now we have a new generation mm -hmm. that's going to grow up on Force Awakens, Last Jedi... And Rise of Skywalker. So, and they're going to look at it in the same way, I think. They're going to look at those movies and be like, hey, this is something from my childhood mm -hmm. that I remember fondly, enjoy. It's an entertainment. And I think that's kind that's of forgotten about when people, because uh, it's so personal to people that we just, we, we lash out mm -hmm. instead of thinking about what the other generations or what other people are going to think about this movie. Yeah, that's a great point. I've, I've, I work with a lot of, I have a lot of colleagues in their 20s, and the amount of prequel references shocked me initially. But then, I, as you kind of pointed out, I realized that's what they grew up with. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to add, I just looked this up, so I didn't, I didn't remember this, but the trailer was initially attached to Meet Joe Black. <laughs> Phantom Menace trailer. So there you go. There's a time warp for you. There's, well, I can't imagine all the nerds being like, 
Oh man, you want to go see Meet Joe Black so we can watch the Star Wars trailer? And Meet Joe Black is actually one it's of a, my favorites from. It's a good movie, but it's a totally yeah. different style of film. I remember this. But it probably theater. had an enhanced box office because of that. <laughs> probably, you well, might be right. I remember the theaters were instituting a no refund policy mm. because people were just going in to see Star Wars and like, can I get my money back? <laughs> this movie's bad. <laughs> so, um, but the one thing that you guys, are, I want to go back and touch on, is like. And this resonates now to why my son, my son Dawson, doesn't really love the original Star Wars movies the way I did because he's seen the new ones with the special effects and the cool, you know, graphics and everything. And then when you go back and show him the original films with, you know, the special effects being amazing for their time, it's just kind of, I don't want to use the term lackluster, but it's just kind of like, oh. Okay. What, yeah, this was all this was all the hype, Dad. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm supposed to like this thing. This is the like... story of a boy, a girl, and a galaxy. <laughs> oh yeah, great, great, Dad. That's a great. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, I did want to touch on Harrison Ford too a little bit because yeah. uh, obviously legendary actor, uh, Han Solo, uh, Indiana Jones. Get off my plane. Ja- uh, yeah, the president of Air Force <laughs> One, Jack Ryan. Um, Legendary career, but I, I always find it humorous that he's always been trying to get his characters killed off in movies. Mm-hmm. I just, for some reason, it's been one of those things that, like, because he, he, the reason they put him in the in the Carbonite in, uh, Empire was because he wasn't sure whether he was going to come back or not. Yep. So just the fact that, like, his whole career, and spoiler, mm-hmm. it did eventually end up happening, has been trying to get Han Solo killed off. The most popular character in probably all of Star Wars killed off because he's just kind of tired of playing him. I have always thought that Loras has kind of been quite humorous mm-hmm. and the fact that he actually spoiled it, like on Conan O'Brien, I think, when he went mm-hmm. on and spoiled the fact that yeah. he did not make it out of Force Awakens before Force Awakens opened. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the fact that they brought him, he was he actually came back in the ninth movie, even for that little cameo. Yeah. And I will I will say that that was one of my oh, moments. <laughs> oh, there he is, one last time. So, yes. Nerd. But yeah, um, you know, I didn't. We don't want to spend you know an insane amount of time on Star Wars. Like I said, we could go on and on and on. We could, yeah. But you know, <laughs> let's let's. Uh, okay, again, I, I do have one question. What's your favorite movie not named Empire Strikes Back? <laughs> I'll take that. I'll, I'll say it's A New Hope. Okay. But I, I appreciate you adding that that little <laughs> addendum there because well, I I think yeah. Go ahead. No, yeah, I think, too, because to me, while I'm not as big a fan of the franchise as you guys are, mm-hmm. two of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time are Empire Strikes Back and Star Trek Wrath of Khan. And I will, I will take that, I will go to my grave saying that, and those two movies are spectacular, so I kind of have to preface it with that, because I know, even if you personally may like New Hope better than Empire, in my opinion, Empire, like, technically is just a better movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's more at stake. Yep. There is it's more dr- drama involved, I would say. Yep. Um, so, Wayne, uh, to you. Gosh, uh, it's like asking which breath of oxygen is my favorite. <laughs> I am going to go with uh, Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. Oh wow! Okay, okay. Wow. Because again, you know what happens. Yeah. You no, know, you're right. It's a crazy ending, man. I love, I love the ending. I, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of. Darth Vader just kicking ass like we mm-hmm. saw at the end of Rogue One. Yep. Mm-hmm. But again, that even right there is a really good one as well. Yes. But yeah, um, I'm gonna go. Yeah, that one. Acting chops aside, to see Hayden Christensen kind of go from that good to evil, yeah. kind of throughout that movie, I thought was pretty fantastic. See, and then we talk about his acting abilities. He did exactly what George asked him to. Oh, be. He, of course. So or it's not so much that he's a his acting was that bad. He was just doing what was asked of him. Yes, this and is true. I just want to make sure everybody gets that because, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's, I'm not that's saying a, that's he's a good, groundbreaking that's a good point. or amazing. I'm sorry, Andy, I think I cut you off there. No, I was just going to, I was echoing what you said. I think that's a good point. I mean, people attack Hayden Christian. I mean, they attack a lot of Star Wars actors, but Hayden Christensen, you know, for those prequels, but then you also think you have, you know, really renowned actors and Ewan McGregor and Natalie Portman Samuel Jackson, Samuel Jackson yeah. in these roles that's not their finest performances either there's probably a bit of a disconnect between George coaxing these performances out of actors I think you could say I think that's fair to say I would say and I think yes yeah. <laughs> and I would say yeah, so 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. I keep stepping in. Go ahead, Andy. Finish your thought. I apologize. Yeah, you, you finish. You finish. Okay. I just, want, I just wish we would have heard Muddy Sue. Then the Wayne goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's not the best director. He's a great mm-hmm. creator of stories, but his direct... I mean, if you look at the original trilogy, he only directed one of them. Yeah. So, like, in, in, in most people's opinion, not the best one. Second best, third, whatever, but not the best one. Um... And I just think his his writing, I think in the prequels, because he was in charge of everything, I think some of it got lost uh, out there. And I think the writing was part of it. And maybe, the, I don't know if they were shooting fast and he just didn't want to go back and do more takes or what. But like the, the, the in Phantom Menace or Jake Lloyd's character, like, again, maybe Jake Lloyd isn't a terrible actor, but the dialogue that he spoke and how he spoke it in Star Wars Phantom Menace was awful. Um, right. Ewan McGregor, I feel like, did the best he could to save those movies. Yeah. And I'm really excited for his TV show coming up. You know, I gotta say, the way he portrayed Alec Guinness's character, or his mannerisms, mm-hmm. and was able to bring his own style into that, Yeah, I definitely give him props for that. Yeah. Uh, Sir Alec Guinness, another one who thought this was an absolute mess and yes. hated every second of filming <laughs> the original movie. I'm sure. I'm sure Harrison Ford was envious of him because he got murdered in the first movie. But he had to keep coming back regardless. <laughs> well, so that's, that's only from a certain point of view. So, yeah. a certain <laughs> point of view. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. <laughs> I assume that's Star Wars nerd nerd stuff. Um, uh, right yes. after. Uh... <laughs> you fought in the Clone Wars. <laughs> <laughs> He was a cunning warrior and a good friend. <laughs> okay. Take the reins back, Kirky. Take the reins. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, you know, and overall, we just wanted to kind of talk about the behemoth that this thing yeah. has become and just how unstoppable it is. Like, uh, we got all these new shows on Tuesday, May fourth. Uh, the the Bad Batch starts, the new animated show from Star Wars. You got the new Obi Wan show coming up. Mando season three. You got uh, Bubba Fett's TV show coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even. They just announced a ton more. This is not going away, people. Yep. They're taking a break from the movies for now, but don't expect that to last. That's going to be probably a small break. Um, the, the gentleman that directed um, the one that everybody hates, last year, Brian Johnson. Yes, he's got. He still got his deal for the trilogy, he does, right? Yes, he's still. So, he's still. That's still in the works. Uh, Taika Waititi, I believe, has been brought on as part of his own like trilogy that he's going to be working on. As everybody probably knows, I'm a huge Taika fan, so yeah. anything he puts his, his hands he's on. The one that directed Thor Ragnarok. Thor Ragnarok, Thor right? Four coming out. Uh, yeah. Love and Thunder. Yes. Yeah. There's no. There's uh, to your point. There's no shortage of like great people involved, as there has been with the Mandalorian for all these shows. Yes. I think the yeah. So I think the expectation expectations are again rising after the. Maybe the disappointment of the sequel trilogy. Yes, yes. And I think uh, it's funny, too, because it, it's it's just more how much harder they're judged than other franchises. Like the MCU, when they made the announcements in that one day, they announced all those Star Wars shows and all those MCU shows. There were so many groans with the Star Wars announcements and then so much excitement with the MCU announcements. Even on a show like, hey, we're going to have a show where War Machine fights uh, terrorism. Like... Oh, okay, I guess, but sure, why not? And then yeah, with Star Wars, it was like, oh, God, they're probably going to mess it up anyway. Yeah. Okay. But you know what? John Favreau and, um, oh, goodness, the other gentleman, Dave Filoni. Yeah. What they did with The Mandalorian to revive just the fandom and to breathe new life in which everybody, I don't remember hearing a lot of people saying bad things about The Mandalorian. No, there aren't too many. No. And what they did at the end of season two and again I'm not going to say anything because it's still relatively new but I, I, I literally great. wept yeah. at what they did and what they were able to pull off so I just I just, I have such high hopes moving forward yeah. and again I'm going to move away from Mandalorian and just talk about the, the cartoons really quick the Clone Wars which is on for what seven seasons yeah. I believe they just finished the final season is, right was now. fantastic um there was another uh, Star Wars Rebels that was on for four seasons. Also highly, highly entertaining. Introducing new characters and tying in the ones we love. And some of the characters they're bringing into yeah. the series now, like uh, Rosario yeah. Dawson's character, you say her name for that. Ahsoka Tano. That one. Um, so, I mean, and she's getting her own TV show. So, 
there are just so there's so much there's gonna be so much over the next few years for everybody to take in so if you're a star wars fan stop trying to be so negative about everything and be positive and just enjoy in the content that's going to be coming out you're not going to love it all probably but you're going to love some of it and don't be mad at my biggest thing about movies is when people get mad at other people for liking things that they don't like stop doing that it's okay for me to like the movie Backdraft, Andy, and you not like it. It's okay. <laughs> well, other than Backdraft, uh, preach on all that, Kirky. I, I agreed 100%. There's, there's so much, you know, don't forget why you love this. I think people have lost sight of that and, and kind of have to, they, they need people to feel their, you know, it's like a dark side analogy. Who you know, wouldn't want to have the sex hate. on they the top of a fire truck? They need everybody to give it to the hate. What's that, what's that, Wayne? Who wouldn't want to have sex on the back of a fire truck while it's moving? <laughs> Classic cinema, Andy, I'm telling you. Yeah, well, <laughs> invite me back. Have you guys already covered Backdraft? Or <laughs> no, we haven't. A... I just know we disagree on it, and my wife recently, as I was watching it, told me, she's like, why do you like this movie? It's terrible. And I'm like, you know what? You and one other person I know don't like it, and that bothers me. It was shot in Chicago, so it's already got my approval. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to finish your thought on Star Wars, Andy, I apologize for dealing with it. Or I could finish it on Backdraft, whatever you want. Sure, sure. Um, (laughs) No, I I won't won't touch Backdraft. But, yeah, I I think just personally, really excited for for all these series. I think Star Wars, you know, we we, we obviously spent a lot of time talking about the movies, but, you know, when you think about it, it probably, the TV, especially TV in a streaming, you know, landscape, is probably the best medium for the series. Yeah. In terms of introducing new characters and having these these plot lines, you know, it's episodic, a la to the callback to the Flash Gordon serials yep. you know, that Jordan yep, Lucas sure. kind of wanted this to kind of embody. So I think it's it's terrific and it's you know it's lightened up um, or, or brought new new light to a series. I think we were all kind of like wondering where they're going to go after kind of the, the you know the negativity that kind of engrossed, especially the last couple uh, yeah. sequels. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I think they're headed in the right direction. I mean, I think we're going to get a lot of good content. Like we said, Mando's been fantastic. We'll see what the Bad Batch brings on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, all right, we're going to move on to our next topic. It is our review of the week. All right. Uh, this week we get Tom Clancy's uh, Without Remorse. Oh, I had some re- remorse, let me tell you. <laughs> Ew. All right, let me uh, let me give out the uh, the details first uh, of you know who's in it and all that jazz, and then we'll get into the movie. All right, so we have uh, Michael B. Jordan starring as John Kelly, and we have uh, Jamie Bell as Deputy Director Robert Ritter, Jody Turner Smith as Lieutenant Commander Karen Greer. Uh, couple other people. Brett, Brett Gelman plays a bad guy, which I thought it was at least fun to see him, even though he was only in it for about five minutes. Uh, but he's usually a very funny man, and in this one, he was not so funny. Um, it is directed by uh, Stefano Solima uh, from a screenplay by Taylor Sheridan, who I usually love, and Will Staples. Um, and it is a Tom Clancy movie, so it takes place in the same world as Jack Ryan. John Kelly is a Navy SEAL, and his uh, team is on a mission in the beginning of the movie, and it's kind of shady. Um, and then when they come back home three months later, the team starts getting murdered. Mm-hmm. And uh, instead of killing John Kelly, they kill his pregnant wife. So then he wants to exact revenge, as so someone would want to do in a movie like this. So basically take John Wick, but remove the dog and put in a woman that we care much less about than the dog. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. Yeah, I, I took it there. Wow. I'm sorry. I... Um, I would argue, though, that John Wook's... John Wook. <laughs> I like that movie, too. <laughs> John Wick did steal probably a little bit from Tom Clancy, who was written before John Wick. Yeah. Uh, now, this is just obviously living in a post-John Wick world. Anything that comes out like this will be compared nice. endlessly, endlessly to that. Um, so, it, it plays out like any other kind of spy thriller, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, there's, you know, espionage, there's intrigue. Uh, there's good guys, there's bad guys, there's obviously someone on the inside um, who, unfortunately, it was painfully obvi- obvious. Early on, I'm like, oh, I think maybe they're not going to make this guy the bad guy. It'll be like the first time in a long time. And then by the end of the movie, it's like, son of a bitch. Yeah. 
Damn uh, yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah. of course, those evil, evil Russians are at it again. Damn Russians. Can never leave us alone. Um, Snatching all people up. Positive things I will say. Uh, Michael B. Jordan uh, deserves all the work that he can get. I think he is a fantastic actor. Uh, I'm kind of glad he's kind of taken the reins of his career right now. Um, he will be making his directorial debut with Creed 3, which I'm excited for. Um, Jody Turner-Smith, I thought, actually did a really good job. Yep. Um, I haven't seen the stuff that she's been praised for yet, uh, Queen and Slim, um, and some other stuff, and she's got some other stuff coming out. She was the most believable soldier in the movie, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and let's see. And the action was fine. I, I enjoyed the action part. Uh, Andy, why don't you chime in here on anything that you thought of uh, without yeah. remorse? Yeah, you know, I have a couple notes here. One of them is you can see the turn of, you know, miles away if you've seen action movies before. Yeah. Um, particularly those that are, you know, skewed for, with, like, conspiracy. Um, I have another note. It just, I just wrote Brett Gelman. Uh, <laughs> it was really, really wild just to see him as Victor Rykoff. Yes. Um, in this, it's kind of the big bad, at least for a while, uh, in the movie. Yes. Um, I, I like, like you, I like Jordan. I thought his performance was good, but the genre just in general needs is overdue for a reinvention at this point we're i still think we're kind of coasting off of we still got the chemtrails of uh born identity you know in so many of these movies. yeah I mean, no you guys you're right John yeah. Wick. yeah but it's just it's we're, we're we're still kind of recycling the same stuff we've seen for 15 plus years so it'd be great to see a reinvention um particularly in something that's so earnest like this that doesn't have much humor to it i mean you mentioned yeah a, a, you know a character close to the uh, title character dying so quickly for example um actually the most compelling stuff about this i thought was just how it ties into the john clancy universe i mean i thought it was great you guys mentioned john wick keanu reeves was actually actually initially attached to this movie back in 95 oh wow uh, the, the, the clancy novel came out in 93 obviously he was red hot with you know Patriot Game, Games and Clear and Present Clear and Danger. Present Danger. Still the best so. one, anyway. I've been... <laughs> um, but uh, it, and it, it kind of had iter multiple iterations after that. For a little bit, Gary Sinise and Lawrence Fishburne were attached. Um, I thought it was interesting that the, the character that Michael B. Jordan plays is a character, and I don't want to spoil too much, but it's a character that shows up in other films. The uh, Liev Schreiber and Willem Dafoe play the same character. Oh, wow. I See, movies. I didn't know those. Okay. I didn't yeah. know they were the yeah, same so characters. I, yeah. Per, I mean, well, there's a minor spoiler in there, so I don't want to say too much more um, for those that haven't seen it. But I think, you know, we're all probably on the same page. This was disappointing. Um, it's, you know, given, I think, what the hopes would be, especially as, like, the big kind of action breakthrough for, yes. for Michael B. Jordan. Um, I... I and it just wasn't. It just didn't add anything that you hadn't seen in, like no. I said, the last plot-wise or even in action sequence. It was kind of like here are one-man army scenes, and here are scenes of like, oh my, what what is going on? I thought I could trust you. Like, yeah, it just toggles kind of back and <laughs> forth between that. There was a lot of that. Um, I there are definitely franchise implications here. Uh, without ends, there is a bonus scene. I'm not sure if you guys saw that, but there is a bonus scene in the credits. Uh, it's it's him and. Um, one of the other characters from the movie. I won't say who. Uh, and they kind of, they tease Rainbow Six, which has been one of Tom right. Clancy's biggest novels, video games. And mm -hmm. so people are hoping that that's what this leads to. Um, I do think there's potential for a franchise here. Even with a weak first entry, uh, there's a possibility of maybe bringing on a different director um, and fixing some of the things that were a problem in this film. I do. I wouldn't be opposed to bringing Jody Turner Smith back. Uh, I thought she did a good job. Um, as far as also her character is for people that don't know this is her last name is Greer. She's related to Will Greer, who was played by James Earl Jones in the uh, Harrison Ford and ah. Hunt for October movies, and then also is played by um, drawing a blank on his on his, on his name uh, in the Jack Ryan series. Is another actor plays him. The Jack Ryan. This was really, it Jack Ryan. <laughs> the Jack Ryan series is really good on Amazon. So if, if this was disappointing to you, or say you enjoyed this movie and you want more stuff like this, I would recommend going and seeing, uh, watching Jack Ryan uh, series on Amazon. Um, Wendell Pierce is his Wendell, name. Wendell Pierce. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I was just no, it just, it just came to me. I was like, Wendell Pierce. Um, and he's great in that role. So she is related to that character who's been in all the Jack Ryan movies. So I thought that was interesting. They do mention her uncle... 
in the movie, mm-hmm. and that's who so that's uh, that who that's supposed to be. Um, so there is that kind of tying in. Maybe at some point, if this again, it's hard to judge the successfulness of a streaming movie, right? right? So we don't know how well it did, how well it's going to do in the future. I think Michael B. Jordan is a, is a name, so he will draw people to go watch this movie. As long as he is continuing to be attached to it, people are going to go and watch. I mean, yeah. I've loved him since uh, he was Jamal in Hardball 2001, yep. and of course, uh, the Wallace Wire. in yep. 2002 yeah. as Wallace. So it it's, it's one of those movies, it is frustrating because it, it has entertaining action sequences, but you guys are right, it's not anything that we haven't seen before. So it, it does make it somewhat difficult... Uh, to wholeheartedly recommend it. But I will say, if you've got some time to kill, it's not an awful movie. It's just not what it could have been. Um, and it... You know, it just... Like you said, Andy, it does a lot of the same things that other movies have already done. So it, it, if you if you like... If you just like all spy movies, then watch it. Because it'll be, it'll be like, ah, I like how this turned out. Mm-hmm. Um... Yeah, and I think, you know, our, our disappointment is probably muted a little bit in that we didn't pick, buy a ticket to see it. Right, exactly. I know the movie was initially initially slated for theaters in the fall, and yes. then Paramount sold the rights to Amazon. So you talked about the sequel. I assume that would be in theaters, you know, at this point. So It may or may not, you know, I'm not sure. Because, because it's now on streaming on Amazon, it may be up to Amazon if they want to, you know, decide to make yeah, another that's, sequel. that's true. I don't know the, so. yeah, I don't know the contract details. Right, exactly, so... But you, yeah, but you have the Jack Ryan tie-in, obviously. Yes, so. you do, which I think that's probably why they bought it in the first place, right? It's a nice kind of connection, even though they don't really aren't in the same universe necessarily. The characters do exist in that kind of same world-ish type stuff. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. As you can tell, listening to us, we're all kind of in between here. It's not very good, but it's got some things that you may or may not like about it. Um, so... This will lead us into our our next movie, which let me just start and say, uh, I'll pose this question. Cinematic masterpiece? (laughs) Oh, oh, wow. (laughs) I mean, where to begin? Where to begin with this? All right. So our first movie, or our our next movie in uh, why this movie um, is called Terror in Beverly Hills, everybody. Now, when I pick these movies, a lot of times it's just because I accidentally come across something on Amazon, which is where most of these movies live. Hey, look, it doesn't have a Wikipedia page. I'll have to go to IMDb. All right. Uh, So, Terror in Beverly Hills came out in 1989. I'm not even sure if it actually came out in 1989, because I've never (laughs) heard of this movie before. It looks like it was shot in 1949. (laughs) It stars uh, the lovable... Singer, brother of Sylvester Stallone, Frank Stallone. Easily the most talented Stallone, right? Yes, obviously. I mean, it goes without saying. Uh, especially with probably, again, the greatest name put to film, Hack Stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that was that was a that, you know you talk about pros for the movie that's 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 a number one right there. <laughs> right there. I, I was like, well, reasons to watch this movie. This guy's name's Hack Stone. <laughs> when they when they mentioned his name, because I didn't look at IMDb or anything, so I had no idea. I was like, did they just say Hack Stone? Like, what the hell kind of name is that? And then when we meet Hack Stone at Hack Stone Studios, where he's a karate sensei teaching. Bill Derrick, also leading to one of my favorite parts of the movie, where they call the guy Derrick and Bill in the same scene. So I'm confused, <laughs> thinking that they called him by two different names, not realizing until I, the end credits when it's like Bill Derrick. I'm like, what kind of stupid freaking name is that? You can keep your snake Pliskin all to yourself, bro. <laughs> um, so, my, I, you know what? My criticism of this movie, guys... Uh, <laughs> Only one <laughs> is not enough hack stone. We get yeah. we get the mention like the first twenty minutes of this movie play out like a serious terrorist film. Like I'm thinking like the kingdom or something like that. You know that's not super serious, but something like it, that's what it reminded me of. Like was like oh wow, they're like I'm supposed to be like taking this like real serious right now, and we get no Frank Stallone in the first twenty minutes of this movie. It's all the terrorists, like, getting his terrorist buddies together. Yep. Putting his 
it's the Avengers segment of putting this team together. <laughs> um, it is slow. It is slow. <laughs> it, it's, it's oh like god. A tra- you're just like, where like is you're watching Freak's a PBS slow? travel log. Yeah. And then so uh, then we get to we finally meet Hackstone after him being mentioned by the terrorist who was friends with Hackstone but now is his enemy. Um, he he then disappears for like the next thirty minutes of the movie. We get a, a gentleman calling a man an Indian man Gandhi affectionately, like it's his nickname, which I was like, oh wow. Um, my favorite is also Bill Derrick arrest and harassed a black man when he was standing outside a jewelry store. The guy just literally walked by the store. He threw him against the cop car and arrested him. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what is this today? Um, <laughs> and then when he loses the terrorist, when he's driving the car and he's just like, ah, I'm going to get these guys. Like, it's just like someone who like. Stole like a like a something from the jewelry store instead of you know guys who just blew up a car and killed seven people inside of a of a, of a store and kidnapped the president's daughter, which is not mentioned so for another like twenty minutes that it's the president's daughter. Yeah, you're sitting there wondering, okay, there's got to be some significance here, right? Exactly, <clears throat> and then you're like, oh, and then why is no one making a big deal about this? What are your thoughts on this film, Andy? Uh, I'm over here just giggling the entire time you're describing it. It's just great bringing back some great memories of the other night watching it. Um, <laughs> let me start with the pros, because there are there are a couple of things I enjoyed. You mentioned <laughs> Hack Stone, but he's, he, he, he kind of only shows up as a relevant character for the last 30 minutes. Yep. Like, there's a, as you pointed, there's a teaser for him. Like I, I say that because like, he's in one scene about a half hour in. Then he's gone for the next 20, and only the very end of the movie. So they must have had limited time with, uh, you know, in-demand Frank Stallone that day and <laughs> on the set in 1989. Um, but I, I enjoyed the, uh, the the police commissioner. Yes. He had he had fun with the role. I believe his a- actor's name's Cameron Mitchell. And he was the only guy I thought that was, like, who, who knew what he was in, in on, oh, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, he knew it was a, a, a crap film from the beginning. Totally. I think a lot of... And that made his performance fun. And so when he was on the screen, I, I, I did have moments of enjoyment. I also wondered if Pepsi financed any part of the film, you know, the choice of a new generation. I don't know if you guys noticed, there was at least, I swear, at least five scenes where a Pepsi or a Diet Pepsi is featured prominently, like even on, like, the president's <clears throat> desk. I didn't notice With, that, no. I, but, it, it, yeah, that cracked me up. And the, the, um, I mean, the president looks like uh, Hagar from Final Fight, the SNES uh, game. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a bizarre callback for you guys, but I mean, th- that's kind of all I have to say positively about the film. I have kind of a laundry list of, I mean, what was going on with the audio? Dude, it, the- all these, oh, everybody in the film, or three quarters of the people in the film were had overdubbed by themselves, yes, I think. Yes, yes. It, it was I, pretty no, awful. I, it, and it, the movie felt like this was, and I, I don't know if it was a trend in the 80s, because there were a lot of movies like this in the 80s, action movies, but like, People came into a big pile of cash, they financed a movie, and they had no idea how to make a movie. It just felt like that. I mean, the production yeah. value was so low, oh, and you God. could tell, like, when they were, you know, like, the car chases were just horrific. It had, like, really bizarre, I mean, you mentioned some of the problematic elements, and there are a lot of, like, stuff that would never fly today. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, there's, like, there's, like really bizarre, gratuitous nudity, nudity in the movie. <laughs> yes, that, that's, that's randomly. That it's, like, really nothing to do with the plot. Like, <laughs> and I, I realize that it's, like, gratuitous nudity, but, like, this is taking that to the extreme. Let's, uh, let's set this next thing in a strip club. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. In, let's go in there and just get a get a nice, nice CU shot of uh, one of the dancers. And the whole um, point of that scene was to set up the black character who then gets harassed by Bill Derrick later in the movie, who then we never <laughs> see that character ever again. Yeah, and after he, after he, yeah, after some, some racial slander on the, uh, the, <laughs> yes. the Indian who's running the bar uh, at the strip club. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it just, the movie just in general wasn't as much fun as I think it, it could have been. No. Uh, obviously, the filmmakers weren't going for that, but I, you know, it, uh, something like Miami Connection comes to mind. Yes, that's like yes. a really fun '80s action movie to watch. And there, like I said, there's a truckload of these types of movies, but this was just the production value was so low. Yeah, 
like who cares about the, I mean, the plot is her, her, horrible like but it, it's almost like you expect that yes although one of the more con- I'll, I'll end with this note i loved how you had this massive story right the president's daughter's kidnapped yes. who's covering this one local news crew <laughs> yes. with one like reporter that has an odd amount of lines i don't know if he, he like you know that he did a favor for the producer you know <laughs> It was, this is a very strange movie on top of It was my uh, favorite thing bad. about that character's name was Tony Mata, by the way. My favorite thing about Tony was that when someone called in a tip to the news line, the news reporter was sitting at a desk with the phone and answered it, and the cop goes, Is this the news station? He's like, Yes, this is the news. <laughs> I'm like, What the hell is that? So. That's like the only character they could get to be. You could tell they definitely didn't film that in a news station. They probably filmed it in like an empty office building oh, or something, yeah. and like just yeah. a bunch of extras pres- and Tony Mato. And then also the president's you, office was down the hall. Yes, yeah, the same <laughs> exactly. Uh, and my other favorite part too about that whole, uh, Tony Mato is it is very obvious that Captain Stills calls him Lamato <laughs> when he's yelling at him. And I'm like, wait, did he just say Lamato? So I rewound it. I'm like, yep, yep, he said Lamato. No, I'm like, oh, he said it again. Um, uh, tomato, tomato. Yes. And then also Mato's great lines of, uh, what a bastard. And then he comes out and yells at him again. He's like, he's such a bastard. I was like, <laughs> did they tell you to come up with your own lines and that's all you could do? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, And then also, I do have to mention that the Hackstone lines. It's rock and roll, honey. Hack don't kill that easy. I think <laughs> those are two. The pl- uh, uh, question for you both: uh, Like, what was fascinating about the plot is you, you know, Hack Stone's built to be this badass character, but given the 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 antagonist in the film, what happens to his family because of Hack Stone? <laughs> he, he's much more of a the villain is more sympathetic, I think, than they would have liked for for whatever reason. They make it like. Horrible! This thing, you know, Hackstone like wouldn't let this guy, like, you know, uh, you know, execute these prisoners, and they kill his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and yeah. Too, when Hack talks about it too, he's like, "Yeah, they killed his family because I wouldn't let him do blah blah blah," and everyone's like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> like it's just like kind of next scene. Um, and the one thing I wanted to bring about the one-liners that I just mentioned, uh, it was a very serious moment between him and his wife. And then to, like, to throw those one-liners in there in a movie that obviously wasn't trying to be very comical, I thought was very funny at that moment. And it, it yeah. made me think that this movie had to have been, like, in production before they hired Frank Stallone. Someone knew Frank Stallone, and they're like, hey, we're doing this movie, would you do this role? And they kind of wrote some more, like, jokier lines, one-liners for him to say because they cast him. Like, I don't know that it was necessarily meant to be, like... That's, that's... You know, like, his role was meant to kind of be somewhat... Like, he was kind of playing it like Lethal Weapon, but it wasn't written as such. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other... You mentioned him, and I'm forgetting his name, but the other lead in the movie... I could see, like, what you're saying, like, because the other lead in the movie... Bill Derrick? He's kind of running the... Yeah, he's running the show for a long time. Yeah. And it's almost like... They tell... tell, He came to set one day, they told him, well, you know... uh, (laughs) Frank's coming in here, so we're going to kill you today. We're going to kill <laughs> yeah. your character. And I'm sorry for the spoiler, everybody, but, you know, we're talking about terror in, the Be- in Beverly Hills here. <laughs> Bill Derrick does not make it out alive, uh, everybody. So right, these colors don't run, son. <laughs> well, and then the other thing, too, that was the other thing I wrote down, is Bill Derrick's on the phone. He's also apparently the negotiator. And then... And a paramedic. <laughs> and that's, I've got medical experience. <laughs> what? He goes oh in there God. with a first aid kit. A guy's got a bullet wound. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, God. It, the, you know what? It is humorous at times. If you can find the enjoyment in this movie, as Wayne and I often say, if you can get a little inebriated and turn on Terror of Beverly Hills, you may enjoy yourself a little bit. Um, it, and, and also, too, they really don't showcase any sort of talent mm. that Frank Stallone has at the end of the movie. Like, he just goes in with a machine gun and shoots everybody. He's a karate instructor. He doesn't really do any karate. Like, you would expect him to go in and, like, neutralize them by knocking them all unconscious. And then, oh, I totally forgot. 
This we're basically explaining this whole movie, people. When they st kidnap his daughter and, and, and wife, and he's like, I, I can't do it. They got my daughter and wife. This isn't my fight. Oh, don't worry. We'll go rescue them. You stay here. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Uh. <laughs> so as you can tell, everybody, while we, we think this movie is awful, it, 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 there are some enjoyable parts to it. So you, you may want to check it out. Worth watching with friends, I'd say. Oh, for sure, this, for sure. This call, this call has made the movie sound much more enjoyable <laughs> yes. since we're able to bounce yes, these yes. thoughts mm -hmm. off one another. If you can give it the MS, MS, you know, mystery science, you know, <clears throat> uh, vibe, you you'll probably enjoy it a little bit. Oh, more. for sure, for sure. Um, all right, so we're gonna move on to usually what we talk about next. Andy is movies we've watched recently, or, t or TV shows. Is there anything that you've watched recently that you want to talk about? Um, another round. The, uh, the nice. film that won Best Picture Foreign Foreign Film yep. uh, at the Oscars. I just watched this last week. Um, and I know I just read that we're going to remake it with Leonardo DiCaprio. I saw that. <laughs> so if you haven't, if, <laughs> let let the, uh, the, the the truthers for another round come out with Pitchforks for Leo. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, 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 again, I thought this was like a, a really, really strong movie. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, people, some people probably won't like the pace that it goes at. Um, and maybe not, maybe too much of a subtle message at the heart of the film for some viewers. Um, I mean, I, I heard you guys talking about foreign foreign films on your foreign film show. Yes, there is. Uh, you have to read read the movie um, <laughs> in, case, in case that's a struggle for, as an entry point. But Mads Mikkelsen's great. Uh, the other kind of main cast members are. I'm not sure if you guys have both seen this one, but it's on a, uh, Hulu. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, no, I, I saw it. I really like that one a lot. Um, I figured that one was going to win, or Quo uh, Vitus Aida. That was another very powerful foreign film um, from this year. But no, another round is something I recommend, Wayne, if you haven't watched it yet. I know I, I talked about it before. I, it's on Hulu. Check it out. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Will about do. Four friends who turn to alcoholism to, <laughs> to brighten yeah, up their ism, day. Yeah, ism is right. Yeah. <laughs> kinda escal it kind of escalates oh, more yes. and more like, well... What, what percentage of alcohol could I give, get away with today yeah, to try exactly. to enjoy my life? <laughs> yes, so, exactly. Yeah, I mean, which is kind of like the disturbing side of things. Yes. But, and it, it kind of that, that's what makes it so compelling, I think, is as a viewer, you know, you, you know, especially as we get older here, we're like, oh, I'm not like I was when I was 18. You oh, know, how sure. can I get in touch with that version of myself? It, I, and I, you know, and I kind of agree with that. Like, it, well, at least when it comes to alcohol, not necessarily by the person I was, I guess, but like, for alcohol, for me, like, I can't, if I have a beer now, like, I'm buzzed. But when I was, like, in college <laughs> or, like, 22 years old, I could eat, I could eat, I could drink, <laughs> drink like, six beers and feel fine, you know? And I'm not saying yeah. I'm driving, but I didn't right. feel, like, it didn't bother me. Now if I drink, like, the next day, I'm automatically going to feel like shit, so. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. It which, is. You know, yeah. there you go. Go watch the movie. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and. Anything else you want to talk? Well, we're going to recap the Oscars at the end here when we're when we're done with this. But uh, anything else you want to talk about, Andy? Um, I did. I just finished watching uh, Made for Love on HBO Max, um, which is I, I would I would I would say worth watching. It's a it's a very unusual dramedy. Um, okay. It kind of imagined. Have you guys discussed this on the show? No, we haven't. We haven't watched that one. No. Yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, it kind of imagines like a a Mark Zuckerberg type of character. Um, it, it, like what if he you know had a he had his own like he was in seclusion um and, along with uh, a woman played by Kristen Malati um and he and he brings her in there and he puts a microchip in her head to, so he can he can like track her oh just like that, um, that covid like, vaccine's really, like, doing to us What's that? Just like that COVID vaccine's gonna do to us with microchips, I tell you. Yeah, what. Bill, that's right. Bill, Bill Gates is gonna be tracking tracking <laughs> you now for the rest of your life, um, like a like a LinkedIn profile. But <laughs> I, I looked um, it up on the smartphone because they're tracking me. <laughs> six that's six G or five G, whatever it yes. is. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Wayne. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ray Romano's in it also. Nice, um, like him. Yeah, it, it, it's a sh it's it's a half hour show of uh, i want to say eight episodes to like pretty pretty digestible like okay. um i would i would kind of give it like a seven seven and a half out of ten so didn't didn't love it but thought there was a lot of great takeaways and like it 
it felt new in terms of its ideas. Okay. Cool. Wayne, you got anything you want to talk about? Uh, I am making my way through Boardwalk Empire. Okay. Uh, solid show. You know, Steve Buscemi is one of my favorites. Dare I say a national treasure? <laughs> Maybe. We'll get there. Uh, let's see. Other than that, what have I watched? Uh, not a whole bunch uh, this week, really. Um, okay. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, I watched a couple episodes of Cougar Town. Uh, one yeah. of my guiltiest pleasures right now, just before bed, background noise and whatnot. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. All right, so a uh, couple things I've been watching uh, lately. Uh, I started, uh, it's only two episodes in so far, but uh, HBO's Mayor of Easttown with Kate Winslet. Uh, I really like it. If you like, like, British cop shows, it's not British, it's actually American, but it, I'm comparing it to that because it's very much like one of those mysteries. Like, if you ever saw Broad Church, uh, it, it feels a lot like that. Um, two episodes in, I'm really liking it a lot. It's Kate Winslet, Guy Pierce. Um, a few other recognizable people that you guys probably know. Uh, I don't have the cast list in front of me right now. Um, but I, I do recommend that. I have been watching uh, the Mighty Ducks TV show. Uh, ah. I did not watch this week's episode yet. Um, but I'm enjoying it. it it's, it's a nostalgia trip, I think, that uh, for if you like the Mighty Ducks movies that, uh, that we had growing up, guys, I think you would enjoy it. It's nice to see Emilio Espos, Espos play Gordon Bombay again. Um, Lauren... Uh, um, What's her name? Graham. Lauren Graham, Graham is really good uh, as the mom of the main character. I believe this last episode or the next one coming up, there's a, a reunion of sorts from the characters from the original movie. Um, so I do recommend it. It's on Disney Plus. It's about 30 minutes or so an episode, and they've got like half the season left, I think, at this point. Um, I also started watching, and and um, we are going to bring uh, Andy back for our basketball show that when we have later this summer. Uh, the new basketball show on Disney Plus with uh, John Stamos called Big Shot. Uh, he plays uh, a former college basketball coach, kind of like a Bobby Knight guy, who uh, hit a referee with a chair. <laughs> so he was basically shunned out of, of college, um, and then he, the only job he can get is coaching high school girls at a um, like a independent school in California. And so he goes there, and it's more of a drama than a comedy. Um, Stamos is pretty good in the role, but if if you like me and you you know you loved basketball growing up, I used to watch Hanging with Mr. Cooper. I used to watch the basketball show that Dick Buckkiss was the head coach on. Um, anything basketball related, I could I could get my hands on in the '90s. I would watch. So it kind of reminds me of that, even though it's not a, a sequel or anything of a show. It still makes me nostalgic for older other NBA, or not NBA, basketball shows and movies that I used to watch in the 90s. Uh, so I recommend it for that. Um, it is fun to see, you know, how how him getting back into coaching and stuff like that. Um, I love that Hang Time got a mention. Just yeah, Hang play. Time. That's what I couldn't remember what the name was. I used to watch it every day after school, Hang Time. For some reason, Dick Buckus was the head coach of a basketball team. I don't know why, but he was. And then they, uh, when he left, or I can't remember if he was first or second, because they had an NBA, a former NBA player come on too. I think to be he was first. Team. Was it Reggie Theus who came yes. on? Yeah, Reggie Theus, yes. And then yeah, it was, so I, was right, I was right there with you watching the show. See? <laughs> I knew you would be. Um, all right. And then I watched, I don't know if you're familiar with this one, Andy. I'm pretty, Wayne, you're, I'm going to guess you're probably not. It's one of those kind of like old horror films. It's called The Devils by Ken Russell. Nope. It's like not available on DVD or Blu ray, but it was on Shudder up until uh, yesterday. <laughs> And it is this crazy movie about this priest who's kind of this radical priest. And he's promised this town uh, that he's able to, like, run his priest stuff with. But he, like, he like sleeps with women and stuff. So he's not your typical priest. And isn't he, though? Isn't he? Isn't he? <laughs> I said he sleeps with women. Oh, um, yeah. oh my. <laughs> yeah. Hard right turn into the wall. Here we go. Anyway, uh, he, like, then he looked at it as being, like, um, a problem. So they set up this plan to, like, basically have him, like, executed. It's this crazy, just 1970s, nutty film. Oliver Reed is the main character. 
phenomenal performance. Probably, I haven't seen a lot of his movies, but the ones I've seen probably his best. It just to watch it for his performance alone is, is amazing. He was fantastic in it. It's a crazy ass movie. I can't even really explain it. It's like a, it's, it's cultish, but it's not at the same time. They make these people believe that they're possessed, but they're really not. There's a preacher who comes to town who's like an exorcist and he's really full of shit. And it's just really just nutty. It's a nutty movie. Uh, but if you get a chance to find it or watch it somewhere, I really recommend it. Uh, just one of those pieces of cinema that you can kind of just be like, wow, I saw that. I don't know if I watch it again, but I saw it. Um, yeah. Just no, like, and, and that, that intrigues me for sure. Let's see, Vanessa Redgrave is also yeah, in Yeah, she's the main, it's her and Oliver Reed are the two main characters. Yeah, and I, yeah, Oliver Reed, kind of, he, I, I'm familiar with him from The Brood, a David Cronenberg yes, yes, horror yes. film. But he was in a lot of seven, yeah, seventies, eighties. He was one of the kind of dominant British actors. If, yes, if that's yes. The, maybe apparently, dominant is the wrong word. Apparently, but. a major asshole, but you know, that happened. <laughs> Died on the set of Gladiator. He right? did, yeah, yeah. He was apparently he was an alcoholic, and they said everyone's like, "Oh no, he was he was clean." It came out recently that he went on a bender that night that he died, and he died like on his way to the hospital from the bar or something. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, go out doing with what you love. Exactly. There you go. All right, so we'll do a, like a brief little recap here on the Oscars. Andy, did you get a chance to watch them this week? This last um, <laughs> like millions of others, no, I did not watch it this okay. year. Um, <laughs> I think I, you know, it, it, I, I, I'd seen only a handful of the movies, um, you know, the ones that were available on streaming. Um, so I, you know, I did have some skin in the game, you know, having seen some of them, and I, I was, you know, pleasantly surprised to see Sound of Metal. Yeah. Um, win a couple awards. That was one of, one of my favorites, and and um, I liked Mank. Um, you know, I think that I think what you know. Yes, twenty twenty was a strange year, and but it also probably hurt the Oscars. That and I'm you can't see me, but I'm doing quote marks right now. There was a lot of bo- <laughs> there was a lot of boring movies this year in the best picture category. Like at least probably eighty percent of the movies I'd classify as boring. And I say that having loved a lot of boring movies mm-hmm. but it was just like hard i think for i know to- i know what you're saying yeah because it's yeah like i liked all of them but you're right like nomad land I, is I, a boring I, movie yeah, yeah i it's really like Nomad Land. Yeah, yeah. but you're right it's not a movie where and wayne and i talk about this when we review these movies we try to tell people so they know going in like don't go into nomad land thinking like you're going to be excited because mm-hmm. you're not it's a movie about yeah. people and how they live their lives and it if you're not into it, you're not going to enjoy it. But if you can get into it, you'll like it. That's what I kind of felt, and it's funny you use the word boring, because, again, I really like Nomadland. It's probably my, I would say, my third or fourth on the list. I really like Trial of Chicago 7, and I really I, yeah. I really thought they should have given it to Judas and the Black Messiah. That would have, that was actually my pick, too. That was my favorite of the nominees that yes. I've seen. I, 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 would, was... I wish they would have given it to that. It had that. Yeah, it had a power to it, I think, that yeah. the other films... Mm-hmm were lacking especially as it relates to and history as we had accepted it to exactly. like oh wow this is a thing that happened right that we exactly. don't know about yeah and the re- and it's not to take anything away from nomad night because like i said i thought it was a great movie it was mm-hmm. beautiful to look at well directed well acted um but what my boring of it is is it's been known that that's the front runner for the last like four months yep. so whenever yep. that happens i always hope at the oscars that they surprise us yeah and they did throw some they, surprises. Not in the they did. Anthony Hopkins. Not in the Anthony categories Hopkins. that I wanted them to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, right. Frances McDormand winning again for Best yes. Actress. You know, she was great in it. I still feel that there were at least two other actresses that had better performances this year. Yeah. And I, I know you hadn't seen the, uh, the uh, Billie Holiday movie. I thought yeah. after I saw that, I'm like, Andre Day is, should win. Mm-hmm. Hands down, should win, no matter what. A great first that's her first movie. It's mm-hmm. so like a great first performance. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Um, but then they gave it to Frances McDormand, making her, because she won the Oscar for when they won Best Picture, she was a producer. So she actually got her fourth Oscar when she won Best Actress because they switched it this year. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so making her the most winningest uh, actress alive right now. She's mm-hmm. tied with, I think, Hepburn, I believe, as the one who's won, a woman actress who's wow. won the most Oscars. Um which is a great feat. She, like we said, she was great in the movie. It was a surprise. I didn't think she was going to win. I'm not mad that she won. Again, what it comes down to, though, when you look at the Oscars, is they had an opportunity to give every award of, of the actors to a person of color. 
They did it with Best Supporting Actor to Daniel Kaluuya. They did it with the woman from Minari who was amazing in that movie. Mm-hmm. That movie is fantastic. We haven't seen it yet, Andy. Um, Not yet, yeah. I guess I couldn't bring myself to pay the twenty dollars to watch it. I know it's, it'll be it'll be. I think it's five ninety nine. I'm with you. Now. It went, I'm it with went you. Yeah. yeah, it went down. It's because it's out on Blu Ray now, right. so it, it is it is cheaper now. Um, but uh, and everyone, I mean, we all thought freaking Chadwick Boseman was winning this year. Everybody thought that that was the for sure winner. I don't. I can't say that he that. I thought he should have gotten it, but I do think Anthony Hopkins probably gave one of his best career performances in The Father. That being said, I would have rather than gone with either Chadwick or um, uh, drawing a blank on the guy from Sound of Metal. Oh, Riz. Riz. Riz Ahmed. Riz Ahmed. Um, just again, you know, and it, it isn't one of those things like I'm not trying to be like, oh, we need to be so woke about everything. But it just, it was one of those things that it was like, of course they gave it to Francis McDormand and Anthony Hopkins. Like, because that yeah. just seems so Oscars. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I said, she was great, but I, Viola Davis yeah. was much better as Ma Rainey. Mm-hmm. And like you said. Andre Day, yeah. Andre, Audra, 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 Andre Day. Was, I, like, again, I, I just, I didn't see that one, so mm-hmm. I take yeah. your word for it. But mm-hmm. Viola Davis, like, I had no idea that was her until, yes. like. The, the Francis yeah. McDormand movie, like, Nomadland, it's a great role for her, but it's not a flashy role. Yeah. Three Billboards was a flashy role. That made mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. Fargo, a very comedic flashy role, made sense. Mm-hmm. This one was just kind of like, again, I don't like using the word boring because it makes it sound so negative against the movie, but that's kind of what it was. It was just a performance. You know, it wasn't like, I don't feel like she went to a lot of lengths to create that character she wasn't not stretched really yeah, right sense. exactly and again i don't want it she was great in the movie she yeah. did what it needed it just wasn't what i was like when i saw the other people that were nominated I'm like oh well these are flashier roles they should win and i will say hopkins was very like his that movie is like watching a horror film which is very interesting mm-hmm. it's about dementia uh once that guys that one comes out cheaper i, I recommend you guys watching it um well do. it's it's really good it's just it was a surprise just because no one expected it. I understand. I, I didn't know he won the BAFTA earlier that day, mm-hmm. which that everyone's like, well, once he won the BAFTA, you should have realized. I'm like, well, I didn't know he won that. So <laughs> at the end of the Oscars, I was still disappointed. And it was such a lackluster way. No one communicated. Apparently, Olivia Coleman was supposed to go up and accept the Oscar for him and give a speech. And no one told, I guess, Joaquin Phoenix didn't know that. Oh, wow. So it was like, we accepted it on his behalf. And it just ended. There was no excitement. No one cheered. It was just like, cr- roll credits. They cut to Questlove. And Questlove was like, thank you for watching. And that was it. I'm like, what the hell, guys? Yeah. <laughs> like, and yeah. I think they, it's, yeah. Trial of the Chicago 7 was completely shut it out. It was completely shut out. That, I think, had, it was funny because Netflix won the most Oscars, but did not win a single award in the top eight categories. Yeah. Which I think was another oh. sign of like, hey, you only won a bunch of awards this year because there weren't a lot of other movies out. Don't get your hopes up, Netflix. Which I thought was kind of shitty. So So the Roma Roma curse continues. Right, sorts. exactly. I think <laughs> I mean look, Parasite did what everyone expected Roma to do, but Parasite yeah. wasn't a Netflix movie. It was a, it was produced by uh uh, Sony Picture Classic, one of those uh, indie film companies. Yeah, but you got you, yeah. you got to just mention the bias that, or like the preju- prejudice. Is that the word? It's like against Netflix because it's yep. basically changing the way cinema is received, or at least it was like one of the for- forefront. Yeah. Pioneers of. Yeah. No, I, it really is. And this year they got to shine, I think, and it was disappointing to see again. That was one of my favorite movies, Trial of Chicago Seven, to see it come away with nothing. Yeah. Um, but, you yeah. know, I know not everyone loves Aaron Sorkin, so I mean that to each their own. But I, I at least thought he was going to win screenplay. Um, it was nice to see uh, Vinterberg or not Vinterberg, uh, Florian Zeller win for The Father. Yeah. So as the only one that watched the Oscars, I'll just say it was somewhat dis- disappointing. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I was going to. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you finish. I, I just again, I wish they would have been more. Just like hey. I don't know if liberal is the right word, but just like, <laughs> you know, just a lot kinda of... Kind of like, like how the, the Golden Globes so were. Oscar-ish. The Golden Globes were much more inclusive. Is that, that, that's what you're looking Inclusive, for. yeah. Just, the thing is, is the one thing I try to get across to people, because, like, even my wife is like, well, was Anthony Hopkins' performance the best performance? I'm like, you can't judge that. 
It's by the person. It's each person has to make that choice for themselves. So my opinion has always been like, okay, you know, if you've got a guy who passed away who gave probably his career best performance, just give him the Oscar. Because you know why? It really doesn't matter in the end. It doesn't. Yeah. It, 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 it really was silly for them not to do it. I, I don't, you know, they. I think they take it more seriously than the rest of us do. And, you know, and I always, it's funny too, because I always get those comments, the, the comments from, oh, well, was he the best performance, are always from the people that hate watching the Oscars because they don't nominate the movies that they like. <laughs> so it's like, I'm like, yeah. well, why do you care? Like, <laughs> <laughs> You can't tell me that John Wick wasn't the best movie of the year, son. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I think yeah, there was a, it was a great chance just to honor Chadwick Boseman's career, a, br- a brief career, but one that had a lot of really memorable performances. Yes. So I think to to what you're saying, like, you can't one, you can't really judge what's the best performance, and also like, it's not a misfire by yes. any means if he were to get it, and it doesn't change Anthony Hopkins' career trajectory or anything like that. He still he still gave a great performance. It got a BAFTA. Yes. I think what uh, the struggle often comes back to with these is like, is it a TV show or is it an you know an award you know kind of an award yeah, show for right. really serious and like yeah. the Oscars kind of doesn't know what it wants to be. Obviously, them shuffling the awards in that manner was like as though it were a TV show, but then like the result doesn't reflect right you know, exactly reflect what that. they the were people, hoping for. The, oh, the few people that watched are left frustrated, you know, that they, <laughs> the they put the time people. in in a sense. You know what, Andy? I was one of those few people. Okay. Well, I say few, but that's really, you know, there's like 11 million people still. Yeah. I think the, 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 the few comes from, this used to be like, you know, a, a few years ago, the number two show behind the Super Bowl every year. And yeah. now it's, you know, no, for like sure. I said, You're right. 11 million. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely lower. Um, so let me ask you this. Aside from uh, Daniel Kaluuya winning for Best Supporting Actor and Soul winning Best Animated Feature, I think those are the only two things that we were correct on, right? Uh, the woman that won for Minari for Best Supporting Actor. Ah, you're right. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, I, I was thinking it was going to be the girl from, from Borat, but I was going to go either. It was one of those two. And she had been winning all the awards. Uh, her spe- I want to say her speech was great, too, because she made the moment. She goes, I want to let you guys know you're not my competition because we all didn't play the same role. You were all great in all of your roles. That's what that woman <laughs> there said. There you go. That's a great way to put it. And Joaquin Phoenix uh, said something similar last year when he won for Joker. Right. Um, yeah. Along the same lines as that, so I, I think it's just again like it. It's just to honor the performances that you love, like right. Like it doesn't have to be like oh well, you know Hopkins did this in his role and Bozeman didn't do that, or <laughs> you, like there's no that's not a thing. So yeah, it just was one of those things. It was very weird. Hopkins, to his credit though, gave a very uh, great speech the next day because he was asleep when he won um, in, in like Scotland. And he woke up and he, he did a thing. And in that, he, he said, you know, I all respect to Chadwick Boseman. It, it's a, a huge loss to the industry or whatever, something along those mm-hmm. lines. So props to him for handling it with, with grace. Because uh, he even yeah. he, that tells you that even he knew what was expected. And it was just kind of great to see him mention him in his speech. Um, Anthony Hopkins, by the way, co-star in Meet Show Black. There's, there's the, uh, the callback. There, there it is, the callback. Um, <laughs> Anthony Hopkins, also the oldest Oscar winner ever uh, for Best Actor, by the way. There you go. For there's any the, acting the uh, performance, because mm-hmm. uh, Christopher Plummer was the, the last one at Best Supporting Actor. So, 80, like, he was 84, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I remember that film. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but I remember that film. Uh, Beginners. There you go. I only remember it because I just watched it within, like, the last five or six years. Like, it wasn't, I didn't watch it when it came out. No, it's like one I'm, a, I'm a fan of that fan of that director. Okay, yeah, uh, uh, you and McGregor were three women. Man. Yeah. Um, let's see. All right, so we're gonna move on. We're gonna uh, basically go to wrapping up the show. Um, let me find my notes here real quick. Sorry. All right, so news for the week: uh, Lin Manuel animated musical Vivo is headed to Netflix. Uh, it's gonna debut, I think, this summer. Bedrock animated series coming to Fox. Adult animation. Uh, Sim- think Simpsons Family Guy. Uh, you know, I want to emphasize when I say adult, I don't mean like porn. Um, 
it'll star uh, Elizabeth Banks as a grown-up Pebbles. So, interested to see how that's going to turn out. Mm. Uh, Fox has cast Rosalind, Rosalind yeah, Sanchez. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're going to talk about adult films, and then you go talk about something <laughs> with the girl whose lead name is Pebbles? <laughs> Come on, now. That's the most stripper name I've ever heard. Um, anyway, <laughs> Fox has cast Rosalind Sanchez as Elena Rourke, uh, descendant of Mr. Rourke, for a Fantasy Island reboot series. Disney Plus okay. uh, FX on Hulu's Alien series to take place on Earth. Adam Weingart, a hot commodity at the moment, returning to direct the MonsterVerse movie, uh, the next MonsterVerse movie after Godzilla vs. Kong. Um, I'm assuming after he does Thundercats or Face Off or both. Um, let's see. Universal rebooting The Borrowers, because that's something we needed. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what the first... John Goodman was in it. As tiny people. Uh, it was a kid's movie back in the 90s. Gulliver's Travels? Similar. Um... This was big news, Andy. Cronenberg returning. First movie in like my eyes eight, perk up. eight years. Uh, reteaming with Viggo Mortensen. And has cast one of my oh. uh, girls that I talk about all the time, actresses, uh, Kristen Stewart, uh, to go along with him. And uh, Scott Speedman. So it's called Crimes of the Future, which is a film he made in the 70s, like 1970. It was like a, like a mockumentary type film. So I assume it has something tied in with that. Uh, they would start shooting in Greece in the summer. So that's for a next year release. Well, uh, I am definitely going to buy a ticket to that. Yes, As a, yes. As a big Very... Cronenberg fan. and uh, I'm, I'm catching up on this as you're saying it. Let, let his last sci-fi script was uh, Existence, which I like a lot and I'd recommend. I have seen that movie, but I have to watch it again. It's been, it's watch been a while. Watch it again. Yeah, especially if, um, it, especially if at the time you watched it and you're like, WTF on this. <laughs> uh, I, I would definitely give it, a, give it a go now that you're, yeah. you, know, you can handle a little more nuance, maybe. Yes, yes. More versed in the weird. Um, yes, yes. Josh Gad and Isla Fisher are going to start in a rom-com series of Peacock called Wolf Like Me. I'm thinking it has some like werewolf kind of comedy to it. I don't know. Uh Journey Smollett and Allison Janney to start a thriller called Lou for Netflix and Bad Robot. Noah Centino has dropped out of the role of uh, He-Man in the He-Man movie. The movie he got jacked for. Um, Finn Whitrock uh, is cast as Guy Gardner slash Green Lantern in HBO Max Green Lantern TV show, which will feature multiple Green Lanterns. His will take place in 1984, I think it said. Who is this again? Finn Whitrock. He is... Um, what, which One of, Green Lantern is he? He plays uh, Guy Gardner. This is the 1980s, it said. So is that, is that going to reference Jordan Wonder Woman 1984 then? What, what, Andy? Sorry. Yeah, I, I was just saying, is that going to reference Wonder Woman 1984? It, it might. I, I'm not sure. The, God, I hope not, because that movie was awful. <laughs> Well, I didn't know if DC was doing this 84 world. No, suddenly. well, because, no, that's, they're going to start in 1941. It's going to encompass a bunch of different decades, I think. Okay. Because they're going to introduce all, like, a bunch of Green Lanterns, I guess, uh, throughout history. Uh, Twilight of the Dead, uh, Romero's final zombie script is apparently in development. Melissa Ross is star in Night Court sequel series, his daughter of the late Harry Anderson. Uh... Play a character, Harry Stone. So she'll play his daughter, which I loved. Night Court was one of my favorite yes. 90s shows. Had one of those Harry Stone, of, Harry Stone, of course, the brother of Hackstone. Of, co- of course, <laughs> of course. Well, he, you know, he's got, he's got, you got to have somebody to help hack it out of all those uh, legal stuff he must get into for fighting crime. <laughs> Baby, it's time to rock and roll. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Netflix has bought Gunpowder Milkshake, which is a female assassin film starring Karen Gillian, Chloe Coleman, Lena Headley, Angela Bassett, Michelle Yeoh, Carlo Gugino, and Paul Giamatti. It'll be released on Netflix this summer. They're hoping it turns into a franchise. Um, I'm interested in that. When they announced that one, uh, probably a few months back or six or last year sometime, I was interested. Uh, so they finally showed like some photos and stuff. It looks pretty badass. Uh, Karen Gillian being the star of that one. Um, okay, movies coming out. Escape Room 2 has been moved up six months to July 2021. Master of None Season 3 is officially coming May 23rd. Andy, I know you and I were fans of the first two seasons. Yeah. Um, In a way, it's getting the getting the, sh- the spotlight here. Yeah, it's going to be uh, more about Lena Wasp's character, I think. 
It looks like it looks like it may I'll be all about her. I'm not sure. Uh, and her lover. So we'll see how that. Uh, it's a little different of a direction. I don't know if he's doing that to kind of deflect some of the stories that came out about him. Probably, yeah. But it'll be interesting to see how that turns out because I love I sort of, that's still like one of my favorite shows on that Netflix has ever done. Um, the Tomorrow War with Chris Pratt and J.K. Simmons hits Amazon Prime July second. Uh, Physical, a TV show starring Rose Byrne as someone addicted to aerobics in the 80s, hits Apple TV June 18th. The show I talked about a week or so ago, Who Killed Sarah 2, drops on Netflix May 19th. Um, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon Eternal Movie premieres on Netflix June 3rd. Sweet Tooth, series based on DC comic book and produced by Susan Downey and Robert Downey Jr., hits Netflix June 4th. Uh, Deaths this week... Adam's Family and Bewitched writer Bernie Kahn, dead at 90. Former Bear and Buck, Gino Hayes, dead at 33 years old only. Apparently he had a liver disease. Mm-hmm. Oscar winner Olympia Dukakis, dead at 89. And Nathan Young of Dark Man and Big Trouble in Little China, dead at 74. So that is our news for the week. Uh, we want to thank Andy Rohr for joining us to talk Star Wars. Everyone may the fourth be with you. Uh... Andy, it was great having you on. Yes, it was a truly a pleasure to be with you guys. I really appreciated the invite and the chance to uh, talk about the Force. Yes, indeed. Wayne, any final thoughts? No, just again, thanks to Andy, and uh, he will be uh, joining us again in the, in the future, so make sure to stay tuned and uh, keep following up with our release schedules because we had a great show. It was uh, great to talk to you again, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. For Wayne Yerke and Andy Rohr, I am Mike Kirkpatrick. Thank you for listening to Now Showing with Mike and Wayne.